Welcome to Inside Albania with me, Alice Taylor. This week, I will look at the results of a survey that suggests the UK could be set for another influx of Albanian migrants this year. And I'll be joined by two Brits who've done the opposite, swapping the UK for Albania. I will also cover recent changes to media laws regarding sexism, the continuing freefall of the euro, the arrest of a former mayor, and Prime Minister Eddie Rama's surprise foray into international diplomacy. Another week and another story from the UK about Albanian migrants. This week, Home Secretary Suella Braverman, infamous for calling Albanians criminals, was handed a survey by the British Embassy in Tirana that found that 50% of surveyed youth in Kuxi, North Albania, still want to go to the UK. 2022 saw 13,000 Albanians make the journey across the channel via people smugglers, with 85% applying for asylum once they arrived. They accounted for 30% of all crossings, something which caused outrage in the British media and parliament and was swiftly weaponised by the ruling Conservatives, mainly for national political gain, but sadly at the expense of an entire nation. Now, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Braverman hailed a huge drop in small boat crossings this year, putting it down to their new policies, rather than the more obvious fact that it was due to terrible weather. Now, the thought of getting in a little dinghy is scary enough without having to factor in the torrential rain and icy wind of the British winter. But despite their efforts, including a very expensive British taxpayer-funded ad campaign on Albanian social media, youth do not seem to have been put off. Albanian Prime Minister Eddie Rama, who has very little time for the comments coming out of Downing Street, clapped back this week, accusing the government of spinning the drama over Albanian migrants. Now, the Home Office has intensified its crackdown on Albanians in the last two months, setting up a 400-strong unit to fast-track nearly 17,000 asylum applications and raising the bar for those applying for asylum or claiming they're victims of modern slavery. Ministers are also targeting as many as 20,000 more Albanians who entered the UK illegally and did not apply for asylum, although they admit that 70 to 80 percent may have absconded from their immigration bail. Furthermore, the British government has lost around 200 Albanian children from asylum hotels it set up around the country, admitting it doesn't know where they are. Now, as well as putting asylum seekers up in hotels, the government announced it will house some 1,000 on boats. Let's just hope they don't lose any of them from there. Last but not least, according to data from Instat, 46,460 Albanians left the country last year, equivalent to 5.3 people every hour, with most not returning. A census currently scheduled for September this year will likely shed more light on the issue. Now, from Albanians leaving for the UK and elsewhere, to Brits and other foreigners coming to Albania. As you may know, I was born in the UK, but in a desperate search for sun, good food and friendlier people, I decided to leave, spending 10 years in Malta and then some time in Cyprus before coming to Albania for a three-day holiday. Six years later, I'm still here, have no intention of ever leaving, and I'm proud to call this country my home. At the end of June, I'm set to take the Albanian language exam as a part of my citizenship application. But as per amendments to the citizenship law tabled by the government, foreign residents with Albanian children, such as myself, would not be required to take the language exam. While there are no public plans to remove the requirement to speak Albanian completely from other citizenship application paths, it has opened up a conversation on whether new citizens should speak the language, and if so, to what level. I took to Twitter this week for my highly scientific poll to ask my followers for their views. I asked, do you think foreigners who want to acquire Albanian citizenship should be required to pass an Albanian language exam as a part of the process? Out of 571 votes, 75% said yes, 20% said no, and 5% were undecided. 
Sot, cam Richard Russell, pronua ni compania te reclama digital neterana în ga scoatsez, de Carolyn Perry în ga The Midlands, ce punon ne historie a sim de culto de tani e ton ne dursi. Te du ian resident afet jat ne Shqipria, ce du an ti aplicoin pe shpet, ne shpeti pe ni pasaport Shqipta. Pushin de tia te du ia de mersi erdet ni emisioni. Hello Carolyn, welcome, and Richard is joining us today online. <laughs> So as we've just heard, Albanians are all going to the UK, and here we are, Brits, trying to get Albanian passports. Richard, you are in the airport in Tehran, and you are in the United States. But what do you think about it? What do you think about it? What do you think about it? First of all, the United States and the United States. So here are the United States and the United States. The United States and the United States are very good. And the United States are very good. And the United States edhe ishte për pun, për nove tek një call center, për kishtë një kontrajt vetëm për 6 muaj. Kër ishte tek pun, e takova Ota. Ota është gruaj ima tani, edhe një jetojnë bashkë në Tehran, një kemi një gocë që është vetëm 8 muaj tani, edhe për ne një kishëm një mundësi, dy mundësi faktë të kishë, dy mundësi, një ishte të jetojmë në Tehran bashkë, apo të shkojmë tek Shkotsia. Edhe për ne, Tiran edhe Shqipëria është shumë e mirë së Skotësia edhe së Angli. Ishëm të kolqestë në Angli për 6 muaj, por nuk ishte për ne. Ishte shumë e keqë për ne. Për ne, Shqipëria është më mirë. Ota e dhonë më ndojmë bashkë që është më mirë për Godson e Tiran, është më mirë për ne, në jemi më lumëtorë në Tiran. Edhe faktë kështë qimë për qimë. Që do të loj në jetim tona është më mirë në Tehran së në Skotësia apo në Angli. Shqip. Shqip është pak fështirë. Qimë për qimë është pak fështirë, por për mua është rëndësishme që unë flasë Shqip që do ditë. Edhe unë përpichëm të mësojnë dy, tre fjallë të reja që do ditë. Edhe të mos ke turpë, mos ke turpë kërë të bërë për një gabim kërë të fletë në Shqip. Shumë rëndësishme, por është vështirë, por që do t'it mësonë pak më shumë, edhe do t'jetë mirë, kach. Carolyn, what brought you to Albania and what is it that makes you want to apply for Albanian citizenship? Well, I first came to Albania a long time ago, 2008. Um, I was bringing tourists here doing cultural tours because the thing that had first attracted me was the astonishingly rich history and culture of Albania and the wonderful archaeological sites. So um, as soon as I came, I fell in love with the country and kept coming back and kept bringing tour groups. And then I met an Albanian man in the UK. So that was it. So I moved here um, over five years ago and I'm hoping to apply for citizenship. And I mean, do you ever miss the UK or is, is Albania home for you now? Albania is absolutely home for me. I do miss my family and some of my friends, but luckily lots of them come and visit me. And I have to say that my diary is getting more and more full because more and more people are discovering Albania and wanting to come and visit. So yes, there is absolutely nothing that I miss about the UK, surprisingly. You are learning Albanian. Um, how are you finding it? Is it a difficult language? And when it comes to the citizenship issue, do you think there should be a requirement to be able to speak Albanian and to what sort of level? So I am learning Albanian. Actually, I first started in the UK doing an evening class. It's not easy to find um, Albanian language classes in the UK, but UCL offer one. So I tried that and that was two hours a week. And I thought, gosh, this is hard. And I thought, when I get to Albania, it'll be so much easier because I'll be totally immersed in it. But of course, my partner speaks English. And um, lots of people, when they hear that I'm a beginner, they also revert to English. Or, because I live in Douras, I get a lot of people speaking to me in Italian. And I speak Italian. So then my brain um, is very confused. It is a difficult language to learn, but it's a rewarding language to learn. And especially when you go out of the big towns, you really actually need to be able to have some level of it. As far as the citizenship requirement is concerned, I mean, that's quite a complex question because there are always going to be exceptions. 
But I'm very happy that um, people, uh, it's, it's part of the requirement, to be honest, because um, when you go and move to a country, you really need to sort of immerse yourself in that country um, to learn the culture, and the language obviously is part of that. So on a practical level, but also on a cultural level, and just for making friends, I think it's really important. Now, Carolyn, a slightly tougher question. As you heard earlier, we were talking about the migration crisis, crisis between Albania and the UK and some of the pretty harsh words that have come from the British government and politicians regarding Albania and Albanians, generalisations and, and other things. As somebody who has been in Albania for a very long time, you have your partner is Albanian, you have strong ties here, you want to apply for citizenship. How do you feel when you hear these things being said in public discourse in the UK? I think the kindest word I can say about it is unhelpful, but actually I think it's um, quite harmful to the Albanian community in the UK, many of which are very hardworking, or most of which actually are very, very hardworking, and make a, a huge contribution um, to the UK um, in many different ways. I mean, I'm a member of the Anglo-Albanian Association, and we have, uh, we're a mixed group. We have as the name implies, we have British people, we have Albanian people, we have people from other parts of the world who come together to celebrate Albanian history and culture. And, and there are lots of um, Albanians within this association who really are in really important jobs or um, providing um, services, etc. I find it very difficult when I hear that uh, these words are applied to the Albanian um, diaspora in England or uh, Albanians who are actually now British citizens and their children. I've heard cases of children being bullied in the playground because of it. It is disappointing. There are lots of stereotypes which we need to continue to counter. And I think um, the culture and richness of Albania itself and the fact that it's becoming more known is really helping that. But Still, when I have my groups come here from the UK, not only the UK, we have um, citizens, lots of citizens from America and Australia in my groups, and um, they say to me, I told people I was coming to Albania, and they said, why? And, um, you know, we have jokes about car washing and things like that, and uh, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a stereotype, and unfortunately, um, it's persisting at the moment, but there are things we can do about it. Um, we have to spread the word and let everybody know what a wonderful country Albania is. I think people like yourself and me and Richard have an important role in sort of spreading the word amongst our family mm. and friends. Um, Carolyn, last question for you. I'm going to ask, you know, the generic sort of question. What's your favourite city in Albania? What's your favourite food? Oh, crumbs. Um, <laughs> a very difficult question because there are so many places that I like. I live in Douras. Um, I love that because it's by the sea. And, um, but I have to say that um, in terms of archaeological sites, I think Bullis is really a magical place to go with those fantastic views of the Viosa Valley. And of course, that's another thing that Albania can be proud of, mm -hmm. um, protecting the wonderful Viosa River. Um, so cities, Berat is very, very beautiful. So I'm afraid... I've gone for a few stereotypes myself there, haven't I? Sorry about that, Alice. <laughs> it's all right, but they were positive ones. They were mm. negative, so we can allow it. Um, and Richard, online, um, I want to ask you as well. I, I believe you have some quite <laughs> strong views about the rhetoric used by the British government in regards to Albania. Can you give me an overview of what you think on that topic? Um, for me, the UK government is its a campaign. It's its its unfortunate that something's been said against just Albanian people. Um, it is a campaign that um, has been used by the UK government time and time again using the immigration and this time it's taken it's, they've taken the turn and put it onto the Albanian people. Um, it's been openly stated by the by the British government and people in power that the targets that they've got are ridiculous for reducing um, immigration numbers. Um, it's quite frankly, in my opinion, just victimisation of yet another minority population. Yes, there probably is a problem with um, illegal immigration. Um, stopping the boats is much the same idea as, as Donald Trump's building the wall type comment. It's it's nonsensical. Um, in my personal opinion, um, they would be much better spending their time 
trying to do some investment in Albania and educating people what life in the UK is actually like. It's not in a, a, the land of milk and honey by any stretch of imagination. Um, there are more and more people leaving places like the UK and USA because these places are not as great as people think they are. Um, there was a small piece by the new um, ambassador uh, in Tirana um, on LinkedIn, which was, I can understand the point they were trying to do, but placing it on LinkedIn was possibly the worst place they could place it. Um, in my personal opinion, the whole campaign is a political campaign trying to trigger um, a vast percentage of the British electorate that are easily stimulated by um, aggressive type tactics um, and the drum, drum, playing the drum of the stop the boat, stop the immigration, stop this other, other people's fault basically for the disasters and the problems that are in the UK. Um, it's unfortunate, as I say, it's against the Albanians, but um, it should be thought of, it can be anybody that just happens to be they've taken the Albanians in this case. It's completely nonsensical in my point, in my point of view, um, and it's rather embarrassing as a British person, which I try and distance myself from every single day. Carolyn, thank you very much for joining me in the studio today and Richard online. I wish you the best of luck in your um, citizenship application and hopefully we can celebrate together when we have our Albanian passports in hand. Sure, follow me in Dere, Dallas. <laughs> Earlier this week, a man stabbed his wife six times before fleeing and leaving their 16-year-old daughter to find her mother and call the police. Unfortunately, cases like this are far too common, and Albania has one of the highest domestic violence rates in Europe, with one in three women experiencing at least one form of domestic violence at least once in her life. But it's not just at home that women and girls are being violated and assaulted. According to data gathered by Byrne between January 2020 and April 2022, 939 articles shamed women and their bodies, 142 justified violence against women, and 32 TV segments featured female sex abuse survivors or their family members. Furthermore, across the top political talk shows, men accounted for 312 invites, while women just 56. In April, the Albanian parliament voted to change the audiovisual media law, including sexism as a harmful behaviour in media content, meaning the media must now prevent the broadcasting of sexist messages, guarantee the principle of equality, and refrain from publishing discriminatory content. The changes are due to the Women Empowerment Network in Albania, who noted gaps in existing legislation, engaged a legal expert and approached parliament, MPs and other officials. After two years, the law was updated thanks to the drive of media and communications expert Valbona Sulce. Valbona told me this is a great step towards the protection of women and girls from harmful narratives in the media, and it represents an excellent example of civil society contributing to lawmaking. Valbona is joining me today online. Valbona, Beyond the impact this will have on what we see on our screens, will it impact the bigger challenge of combating sexism and violence against women in our society? Yes, I think that uh, having a law that defines what it is sexism and what it is not allowed to spread sexist messages through audiovisual media will affect the uh, perceptions of society about the treatment of women and girls in society. So the uh, aim of uh, the amendments we uh, pushed forward with the Parliament of Albania in the law for audiovisual media to uh, have the definition of sexism and also uh, ask for an intervention from AMA to prevent uh, audiovisual operators, which are radios and televisions and all their uh, website pages, because the definition also uh, um, says that sexism is considered everything that happens in offline or online world. Uh, I think that uh, um, the, the main change that this law will bring is the change of mentality. It is not okay to have sexist jokes, sexist ads, sexist uh, um, reporting and objectifying, sexualizing women and girls in the screens 
and also having reporting on domestic violence that uh, blames the victim and not the uh, violator or the perpetrators on the action they have uh, done. Because I think the main problem we have as a society, this is not something that it is happening only in Albania, uh, but uh, we are normalizing it. And this is not good and this is not normal uh, in the 20th Second, uh, 21st century, it is not normal to um, justify sexist behaviors and to support them. Four years after being declared persona non grata by the United States Department for major corruption, the former mayor of Dures, Vandrush Dako, was arrested in Albania for abuse of office, along with other former state employees. The court issued an arrest warrant based on a permit issued years after the building was already constructed and a tender which cost the state budget over 162,000 euros. Daco was elected mayor of Duras in 2007 and won the following two votes with a significant lead under the banner of the ruling Socialist Party. Now, investigative documents and wiretapping obtained by the media and published in January 2019 raised suspicions that a criminal group was involved in vote buying in favour of DACO during the 2017 general elections, something he denies. He was questioned for several hours last week before turning himself in on Tuesday evening. Freedom House recently praised Albania for several arrests and convictions of high-ranking officials for corruption. And furthermore, the EU has stressed that such convictions and a crackdown on corruption and organised crime are essential for Albania's progression towards EU membership. However, last week, former Interior Minister Saimir Tahiri, who was serving three years and four months for allowing the cultivation of cannabis while in his ministerial position, was released. Tahiri will serve the rest of his sentence, one year and eight months, on house arrest. U.S. Ambassador to Tirana, Yuri Kim, called his release disappointing and said it reflects the old way of the justice system before U.S. and EU-led reforms. Now, in case you hadn't noticed, the euro has continued its descent in the Albanian market this week, reaching 106.50 lek for one euro on Thursday, the lowest level since the euro was allowed in circulation. Also in free fall is the British pound being exchanged at 123 lek and the dollar at 99 lek. Experts say this comes due to a high circulation of foreign currency in the market due to the start of the tourist season, which is still yet to reach its peak. Another influence is said to be from the real estate market, which has seen an increase in sales to foreigners of 50% in the first quarter of the year, reaching a total of 290 million euros. Now, this situation favours those who have income in LEC and expenses in euro, as well as importers, but it poses problems for exporters. In May, a coalition of export company representatives called on the government to take urgent action to protect bankruptcies. This week, the Belgrade Pristina crisis has rumbled on, but it's taken a more political turn as protests have all but subsided in the north of Kosovo. With the US and EU using stern words and not so subtle threats of consequences and reports of sanctions being prepared if Pristina does not step in line, the pressure has been on to find a solution. On Thursday, Prime Minister Eddie Rama surprised us all when he announced that he had forwarded a draft for the Association of Serb Municipalities to French President Emmanuel Macron and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, as well as the EU and US. The association was agreed during EU-backed dialogue in 2013 before being ruled unconstitutional by Kosovo's highest court in 2015. Since then, it's remained a sticking point in all negotiations with Serbia. The US and EU are insisting on it, while Kosovo maintains that Serbia has not stuck to various provisions it agreed to, and they add they're happy to create an association, but it must be in line with the constitution. Rama said the document he submitted has been long prepared and he was waiting for the right time to present it. Drafted by US and European experts, he said the time has come where both Kosovo and Serbia cannot even agree on who will write the text, let alone on what it will contain. He added the document may not be perfect, but it is in line with the country's constitution. 
The situation is becoming alarming and I cannot remain a spectator watching Kosovo shrink and shrink in the eyes of those who created the state of Kosovo, said Rama yesterday. He also commented on the demands from the international community and fears over the North falling into the hands of what he referred to as foreigners. Now, the German ambassador and the French ambassador in Tirana declined to comment to Inside Albania on the proposal. The EU Commission did not respond to any questions and the French government said they have their own plan and would not comment further. Only the German government confirmed that they'd received the document, but they wouldn't elaborate on its contents. As for reactions from Kosovo to the draft, these have been mixed, with Prime Minister Alban Kurti refusing to properly acknowledge its existence or respond to requests for comment. The ruling Vatvan Dosia party deputy Armand Moya said it's a sign of Rama's closeness to Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic, while Deputy Prime Minister Beznik Bislimi called it a Trojan horse which will fulfil Serbia's desire to partition the north back into Belgrade's control. That is all I have time for this week. You can catch me every week at 4.30 on Euronews Albania, on YouTube or across all major podcasting platforms. Inside Albania, Vetem Mejoronus, Mirapavsia.